Thanks again to Mike and the organizers for uh, having me here. It's a great honor to be able to uh, talk a bit about the work we have been doing uh, in uh, GREAT at Kaspersky Lab for the past uh, 10 years. So actually my team celebrates uh, 10 years of uh, existence uh, this year. It was just a few days ago. Um, we were looking back at some of the things we researched during the last 10 years uh, while um, um, I was in great, um, and we realized that there's like a lot of things out there, there's a lot of threats. These so are maybe some of the things that we uh, talked about during the last years. I guess maybe um, how many people are familiar, let's say, with the Stuxnet? Um, that's okay, pretty much everybody. Uh, but other things such as uh, Flame, Dooku, Net Traveler, Red October. Um, these are some of the, let's say, big research uh, that we have been doing uh, throughout the time. And to be honest, uh, this hasn't been kind of risk-free. So I do remember, actually, um, it was in 2010, um, the Virus Bulletin Conference uh, took place here in Canada, in uh, Vancouver, and I was invited to make a speech about Stuxnet. Um, actually, one of my colleagues, Alex Gostev, was originally invited to present there, but he couldn't get the visa in time, so he asked me to uh, fill in for him. So I said, sure, no problem. Um, I need to get myself familiar with Stuxnet first. To be honest, back then I was not uh, paying a lot of attention to these uh, big APTs, nation state things. So I got myself familiar with Stuxnet, and I went to Canada. And I, the moment I, you know, I stepped on the stage, and I, I noticed there was a kind of a tension in the air. Uh, and especially, I noticed there were three guys sitting at the back of the room, like everybody else was standing, uh, was sitting, but these uh, three guys were actually standing, and they didn't look very happy at all. And obviously, uh, well, there was something which uh, kind of um, bother them about this Stuxnet presentation. So later I went to the organizers and I asked them, do you know who are these three guys who actually came just for uh, my talk on Stuxnet and they left the conference uh, afterwards? So they said, well, those are kind of strange guys. They came, uh, they paid the, for the entrance with cash. <sighs> All right, <laughs> that's a good sign. And um, I said, okay, so where are they from? And they said, well, they put uh, next to their company name, they put GOI. So I said, what's GOI? And so like, well, government of something. So um, I think that, you know, some of these things uh, have been kind of uh, tricky. So after the conference, actually I went back uh, to Romania and about a month later, uh, I went back home and you know, I, I got into my home and in the middle of the uh, table in my dining room, there's a rubber cube with the message, take a break. So my wife looks at the cube and she says, like, why did you put this on the table? And I'm like, well, I didn't put it on the table myself. So she's like, of course, but who put it? So, well, not to scare my wife, I did say that I put it later. But I didn't put the cube on the table, uh, basically. So, you know, doing this kind of research is not always uh, risk-free. I did take a break after finding the cube on my table in my dining room. Well, but only for a few months. And afterwards, I realized that uh, this is like not the right way. So um, if you give uh, up to fears, then you will never be able to do um, important and big threat research. But um, maybe a few words about um, maybe everybody's favorite subject nowadays, fake news. Um, the 2016 USI elections, uh, I was in Barcelona with um, my team and one of my uh, guys from the US, I asked him, who do you think is gonna win the elections? And he said, I'm confident it'll be Hillary. I said, why? Well, he said, there's this guy who is doing predictions for the New York Times and he's got pretty much all the results correct for the past uh, 10 years or so. So I said, you're absolutely confident. Yeah, so, all right, the election day is come. You know, the next morning I wake up, I go to Google, and I Google for elections. And the, uh, like, the first hit, Google, you know, shows a photo of, uh, of a young lady, something like this. 
<laughs> and like, well, what's going on? <laughs> well, everybody knows what was the result of the elections. Um, but this is a uh, one of the few nice pictures where you can see both the candidates uh, looking, you know, smiling. And most of the other pictures, uh, they either look, one of them looks bad and the other looks nice and so on. But maybe not many people remember that before the elections, uh, there was a guy called Guccifer. And why is this important? Because Guccifer was the first guy who claimed that he was able to break into Hillary's uh, famous email server. And he uh, not only said that he was able to break into the server, but he said as like many other guys there, like it's me, the Chinese, the Russians, and so on. So actually, who was this guy? Well, known by his full uh, name, uh, Marcel Lazar Leher, a Romanian guy, Guccifer was actually a Romanian hacker and a taxi driver. And the reason why he chose this uh, name is because he said that he combines a style of Gucci with the light of Lucifer. It's kind of weird. Um, he's like probably got some issues uh, up there. Um, what's amazing about Guccifer is that he had no skills. He had no knowledge except what he found on the internet. So he was a self-thought hacker, basically. Some people would call him maybe a script kitty, but nevertheless, uh, he was uh, quite successful. He was able to hack Colin Powell's email, uh, members of the Rockefeller family. He was able to hack the emails of several FBI and uh, US Secret Service agents. He was able to hack Corina Kretsu's email and Georgia Mayer's uh, email. And of course, many people wonder who are these, like, and why do we care? Well, Corina Kretsu was actually a Romanian politician, um, and it's quite interesting to know how he was able to hack into her email. Um, he got to uh, her, um, well, she, he knew that she has a Yahoo account, so he went there, he tried to reset the password that one of the questions was the name of the city where she was born. And because she's a politician, everybody knows uh, where she was born. She was born in a city, was born in a city called Braila. So that's the first question. The second question was the name of the street where she grew up. So what he did was actually he tried all the street names in Braila until you know he got the right street name. And that's how he was able to hack into her account. Now the more interesting uh, guy is Georgia Mayer. Well, this was basically the top man in the Romanian intelligence. He was the head of the Romanian intelligence service. And he was able to hack into his email. And not only that, but he tried to blackmail him, which is kind of funny, of course. Uh, he not uh, uh, called him, he also tried to call him a skunk and he tried to get some money from him for not releasing the emails. Now, uh, while Guccifer was hacking the emails of FBI agents, Rockefeller and so on, you know, nobody pretty much cared in Romania, I guess. But when he hacked the top man into the Romanian intelligence, well, two weeks later, he was arrested. So. Uh, he was put into jail, basically, and uh, awaits uh, extradition to the United States. So that's the story of Guccifer. Now, why this is uh, like relevant to the elections? Um, everybody probably remembers the famous uh, DNC hack, and um, basically, uh, CrowdStrike, which is a great company, a lot of respect for them, they uh, were hired by the DNC to investigate the hack, and. After the investigation, they wrote a blog post and they attributed uh, the intrusions into the DNC to two different hacking groups, one of them called Fancy Bear, also known as Sophocy or APT28, Pwnstorm, Tsar Team, many names. The other one known as Cozy Bear. Um, why this was interesting? Because uh, almost immediately, um, a new guy appeared going by the alias Guccifer 2.0. And he set up a blog post uh, on Blogspot, and he, uh, you know, what he said was, uh, you know, CrowdStrike is trying to convince you guys was the uh, Russian intelligence, but actually there's none of the sorts. It's just me alone, a lonely hacker. And actually I can prove it. Here's some documents which I took from the DNC network. So, like initially, of course, this was a huge blow. Uh, and it's hard to, um, sometimes it's hard to understand which one is right, obviously. Uh, we had no doubts that CrowdStrike was right and Sophocy and uh, uh, Cozy Bear, Cozy Duke, have actually been in the DNC network. But what was going on with Guccifer? And quite a few people actually tried to uh, 
uh, talk a bit to him and see what's going on. Uh, one of my friends, Lorenzo Franceschi Vicerai from Motherboard, he tried to interview Gucci for 2.0. And he asked him, where are you from? And he said, I'm from Romania. And uh, Lorenzo is Italian. You know, he tried to talk a bit with him in uh, Romanian, for instance, asking, uh, do you speak Romanian? Sure. Uh, where did you put Russian metadata into the documents? And he said, well, este filigranul meu, which means it's my watermark. And then he said this, he repeats this word uh, filigrane or filigran. He actually repeats this word a couple of times. And now, um, well, any Romanian speakers in the audience? Wow, quite a few. Uh, have you ever used this word before, filigrane? One guy, <laughs> interesting. Uh, I think I have friends, uh, maybe my age, who probably never used this word in their life. Unless, uh, you know, maybe wor you work in printing or something like this. It's a very, very unusual kind of a rare word. And not only is that, by Gucci for 2.0, he was making quite a few mistakes um, when he was trying to talk in Romanian. So, obviously, why was he uh, doing all these mistakes? So, actually, if you go to Google Translate, you know, and do, it's my watermark, you get this uh, este filigranul mel. I think that anybody uh, in Romania, uh, they would say uh, este watermark mel. So we'll just use the English word for the same purpose. Nobody will use the, uh, let's say, dictionary translation of uh, watermark. So, yeah, that kind of um, gave uh, Gucci Fer away that he wasn't uh, who he was claiming to be. And it wasn't until recently uh, when uh, the Department of Justice indicted a couple of uh, uh, Russian officer, intelligence officers for this hack. Uh, and it's quite interesting. They uh, were able to pinpoint uh, this Gucci for identity to a couple of these guys. And they say, how do they know? Well, uh, they're quite confident it was uh, this group behind the blog post because basically uh, they were searching on the internet for some English terms, just to make sure they use correct English, such as some hundred sheets, uh, some hundreds of sheets, like, you know, um, it's sometimes it's hard for non-native English speakers to find the, the pl plural of uh, hundred. Is it some hundred, is it some hundreds, uh, and so on. And later, they use these exact words into the blog post which they published uh, on WordPress. This is the uh, copy of the uh, blog post and the exact words they were searching uh, on Twitter. So it didn't like took a long uh, for the US intelligence to be able to point who was behind uh, this attack and this uh, disinformation campaign. So it was quite interesting that there are still missing parts of the DNC story. So not the, uh, let's say the entire story is clear. Um, for instance, there's been uh, this uh, indictment which deals with the hackers known as Fancy Bear. Actually, it's amazing there's basically zero mentions at all in the indictment about the other hacking group, this one, Cozy Bear. So actually, it was uh, quite an unusual hacking group. They were very dynamic. They were very active uh, back in 2014, 15, 16. And then at some point, they just simply disappeared. So everybody lost track of the uh, Cozy Bear. Uh, we also call them the Dukes. And um, my company, we were the first to publish about them in 2014 under the name uh, Mini Duke. So at the moment, like everybody's kind of wondering, where are the Dukes? So just one of the uh, open questions in this whole uh, hacking of the US elections uh, saga. So the whole story about Gucci Fair and his uh, well, let's say unusual use of usage of Romanian words, it got me thinking. And I was wondering, can we find um, these kind of watermarks uh, between different uh, attacks? And can we actually build some kind of a system which will allow us to pinpoint future attacks to previous incidents and to connect uh, hacking uh, incidents across the time? So that's how I got, you know, I started thinking about uh, code similarity. And actually, I remember very well what was happening on the morning of May 12th, 2017. Anybody remembers this date? Well, I was in the office. It was a Friday. 
usually uh, you want the Friday to be quite, uh, you know, quiet, you know, peaceful. So the last thing you want to hear on a Friday is uh, for one of your guys to write you a message and say we have an emergency. There's an outbreak. And you look like, a, man, it's a Friday. It's like, uh, you know, <laughs> you don't want to, like, who wants an outbreak on a Friday? That's, that's kind of a terrible thing. Um, and, like, slowly news started to appear. This is how computers were looking like some of the computers in the uh, industrial control um, center. This is the, um, uh, a desigual, a very uh, posh, uh, uh, closing brand from Spain, Hotel, uh, Sberbank, which is a Russian bank, got hit by that. The transportation system in Frankfurt um, was also hit. ATMs in Hong Kong and uh, Singapore. And, you know, pretty much WannaCry was kind of everywhere. And that actually led people to um, make some funny um, versions of this attack. <laughs> Um, so I hear Nokia is having a, a comeback with these uh, old phones. Well, the, like the battery lasts for one year or so. Or, uh, you know, not the usual stuff we have nowadays. Microwave ovens, washing machines, Google glasses, <laughs> air conditioning, smart. Well, WannaCry was you know pretty much everywhere. In <laughs> Nintendo. Yeah, that one's my favorite. Um, yeah, like, you know, the Matrix was kind of owned by uh, <laughs> WannaCry. Um, and, you know, as the story was unraveling, I was in the office, the family was, uh, was upset, like, what are you doing in the office through the weekend? We have an like, outbreak. And my wife asked, who is responsible for this outbreak? I want to punish them. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, Mm, good question. <laughs> I don't know yet. And honestly, it wasn't until um, Monday when Neil Mehta, who is a, uh, he's a uh, researcher working for Google, he posted this message on Twitter. And the moment that I saw the message, I said, damn, he's right. And of course, a few other people asked, uh, what, what does it mean by this uh, message? Actually, it's just a few numbers. So if you look at the message, actually, um, um, it's pretty obvious for everybody, I guess. If not, uh, it's just, uh, what's, what do we have here? We have, like, actually, there's two hashes. So he means uh, here's these two samples. And here's um, two different offsets in these two different samples. And that's, like, one encrypt uh, attribution. So what do I do? I open these two samples uh, myself. Uh, you have them here on the screen. Uh, one of them is a version of WannaCry 1.0 that was originally used in March. So we were in May, version WannaCry 2.0. But in March, someone used this WannaCry 1.0 to attack uh, uh, like a different uh, number of companies, not as many as WannaCry 2.0. And the other one is a malware sample from a group known as Lazarus, which has been previously associated with the North Korean uh, hackers. So what do we have here? We have basically fragments of code which are the same across WannaCry and uh, these uh, older uh, Lazarus samples that were used uh, in the 2014 uh, attack against the Sony Pictures uh, Entertainment. So it was like for me, it was pretty obvious that this is like an amazing way of identifying you know, new attacks and seeing who is behind them. And uh, it allows you to very quickly understand, but actually, how can you do something um, uh, similar to what uh, Google was able to do here and uh, Neil Mehta wrote about? So the full story is the following. In 2011, Google bought a company called Zynamics. Uh, and I had a meeting with a Google engineer in 2014. We were working together uh, on a uh, project. And um, I asked him, how can we search for other samples which are similar to this one? And he said, you know, it's easy, man. You just spin 10,000 machines and you do a string uh, search in parallel. So I said, nice. I went to my CTO and I said, uh, uh, boss, can we buy 10,000 machines for this task? <laughs> and well, you guessed the answer. And then in 2017, Google was able to link WannaCry 
to the Lazarus Group. What's interesting is that actually Google is not the only company which has such technology. Um, another company, a Romanian company called Binary, they developed the same technology and later they were a crow, uh, acquired by CrowdStrike. And uh, there's also an Israeli startup at the moment uh, called Intezer, which has pretty much the same capability. So I thought that we, this is something that, in my opinion, will kind of reshape the way we do threat intelligence. So this is something that uh, we need to have as well, and probably every other company should have the same. So the only question is, how do you do that? And you have to do it like at a huge scale. You have to do it like with big data, right? Um, and there isn't like the theory behind it, the mathematics is not that hard. You just generate, let's say, all the possible uh, eight or up to 16 uh, byte substrings from the samples, and then you just check for overlaps. The only problem is that our malware collection is about five petabytes at the moment. So doing something like a search across these five petabytes takes about two weeks. And uh, the, we don't have budget to purchase 10,000 machines for this particular task. Uh, our goal, you know, is to protect our users, but this doesn't uh, look like it's a very efficient way of doing it. So one of the ways we thought we could actually use um, a tool called Yara for this. How many people are familiar with Yara? Excellent. Um, Yara is a, um, basically in a nutshell, is a very nice tool created by Victor Manuel Alvarez, uh, also known as uh, Plusvic. He's a uh, Cuban programmer who works for VirusTotal, was purchased by Google. And he created this language which allows you to search uh, for interesting patterns uh, across uh, malware samples. So he calls it actually the Swiss knife for malware researchers. So. How can we, let's say, combine this with the big data and try to emulate what Google was doing? Well, first of all, the idea is not to use all the possible combination of strings from a file, but maybe first identify the relevant ones. And uh, you build a Yara rule from the interesting strings in a sample, and then you just use that Yara rule uh, later across the collection. Now, there's, let's say, a, a few um, drawbacks to this problem. One of them being that, the, well, let's say 100K file, there's uh, obviously uh, 100,000 uh, 16 byte substrings in that sample. So even after you filter out the clean one, and for that you need to have a very good uh, clean collection, so a set of clean files. You uh, take all the strings from the clean files, you weed them out from the suspicious samples, and you're still left with about uh, 30,000 strings based on our experience. So how do you know, let's say, which ones are interesting and which ones are not? Here's a um, typical example, like the string on the top is a uh, quite interesting string. Um, it can be used for these kind of uh, searches, but the string at the bottom is not very useful. Uh, even if it doesn't appear, let's say, in many clean samples, as you can see, uh, this is full of uh, CCCC. Anybody, any idea what CC means? Uh, well, Intel x86 opcodes. Uh, well, it's the uh, int3, so it's a debug instruction. So obviously anybody can have these debug instructions in their code. So it's not necessarily interesting. But if you extract the interesting ones, and the idea, how do you know which ones are interesting? We built a uh, basically machine learning system. We trained it uh, with the samples, and we discovered that some of these strings uh, based on Markov chains uh, are actually more efficient at finding code uh, overlaps. So here's an example. Uh, this is a Yara rule that our system built for uh, something called ShadowPad. I'll mention it later. So these are all shellcode fragments which appear in these shellcode, in uh, these ShadowPad samples, but they do not appear in any other clean or malware samples. So, of course, this system can be improved. You can first test it uh, across your big uh, APT samples collection. Uh, find if it detects other APTs by common strings. Uh, you modify the rule to keep only the um, strings which hit across different samples from the same uh, thread actor. And then you run it using some big data like uh, VTMIS, which is Virus Total Malware Intelligence System, or Clara, which is our own equivalent of that. So just some numbers about this system. We uh, process about a quarter million samples per day with it. Uh, it knows about uh, 56 million 
known clean samples. So those are like Notepad, right, from Windows. They are not malicious. Uh, from which we extracted about si uh, 6 billion strings, and it has about 10 billion of uh, known good opcodes. So let's see, actually, what we can do with this uh, amazing system. All right? So um, we had like a very interesting engagement. Um, I think it was around uh, of, uh, August 2017. Uh, a bank called us, and they said, well, we kind of think we're infected with something, but we can't find it. So can you guys come over and take a look? So sure. Well, a guy from my team went to the bank, and he said, why do you think that you are infected? And they said, well, in our network monitoring, we observed a couple of DNS queries for a number of domains, uh, which result like in NX, non-existent. And they come from the system which we use to make the big payments. So that's the system we use to transfer uh, money across the SWIFT network. And we, the only issue is we check the system and we can't find what's wrong with it. Like there's apparently nothing wrong. There's no malware detected. And we did our best looking for new files and any signs of uh, something which could be wrong with the system, but we can't find it. So what my guys did, they did a memory dump of the system and then they searched for those DNS names in memory. They found the process which was issuing this DNS request and they found it was actually a tool from a company called NetSarang. It was a remote administration tool that the bank was using across all of their servers. And well, the first thing they did, they, we took this tool, we found that the code was uh, issuing the DNS request was in a DLL inside this uh, NetSaran software. So we looked and we were trying to understand why the software behaves in this way. And there was a kind of a payload that was encrypted. So we were wondering if this like, isn't maybe the normal behavior of the tool that it has this payload inside. Um, but later we discovered that this uh, encrypted blob only appeared in the last version of NetSarang, which the bank installed like a week ago. So we got in touch with NetSarang. Uh, they discovered that they have been compromised and they have been used in a supply chain attack. And it's amazing, you know, uh, how this software, which is used by uh, uh, Fortune 500 companies, was used as an you know, entry vector uh, into all these uh, high profile institutions like financial institutions and so on. So we used our system, we were trying to understand who was behind this attack. So we used our system on the code from the uh, NetSarang incident, and we actually discovered that it's similar uh, to uh, something called poison plug used by uh, a WinNTI uh, uh, subset group. Actually, uh, a few hackers from the WinNTI uh, APT, uh, how we call them in 2014, were just indictment, indicted by the uh, FBI, I think maybe it was just two days ago. And it's funny that the names and the analysis of one of the guys from the indictment appears in our research paper from 2014. So our system like immediately found this overlap with a sample used by an APT known as Barium. Um, if you Google Barium, you'll find a few mentions of them, uh, like um, they've been responsible for a, a number of high profile breaches into um, one of them, which is maybe uh, more known uh, publicly, was a breach into uh, Thies and Krupp, where they tried to steal some uh, submarine uh, schematics. So if you're wondering exactly what the code does, it's actually a function they use to calculate hashes uh, of APIs. So we immediately assumed that this uh, shadow pad incident was related to these guys. Uh, another interesting case was the sea cleaner incident, which was uh, another very big supply chain attack. Actually, it was much bigger than the NetSaran compromise, because uh, there's about 20 million users of sea cleaner. So, like one day, uh, a piece of code appears in sea cleaner, you know, magically, which does a kind of shady things. And all the people who have sea cleaner installed, they get the update, and the malicious code obviously reaches out to the CNC and uh, tries to do bad things. So again, we used our system to check what's that. And we immediately found a custom Base64 encoding subroutine inside the CCleaner code and an older sample uh, uh, called uh, known as uh, Missile, 
from an APT group known as APT-17. Um, I guess the most significant uh, attack from APT-17 is the Aurora hack, uh, which uh, I think it uh, made Google pull out of China a couple of years ago. Here now they're going back. Um, so I immediately, you know, I put it on Twitter that we think that this is related to this uh, Axiom APT. And it's quite interesting that in Tether, the Israeli company that I mentioned, they immediately posted uh, pretty much the same thing, that their technology also thinks that it's related to um, uh, APT-17. So uh, what we did actually uh, using this uh, Yara roof generated from the sea cleaner, we ran it on our collection. And it, fit, uh, it hit a number of samples uh, known as missile, uh, Zox PNG, and uh, HiKit. So as we were looking at this, we are quite familiar with all these uh, samples. And actually, there is an amazing presentation uh, about this missile. And actually, missile is a hacker name. is a uh, hacker alias. And this guy, uh, missile, um, well, there's a very, very good presentation uh, from Chris McConkey at PwC. You can find it on YouTube. And he talks uh, like uh, about the methods he used to identify this guy. So he was able to find his name, pretty much everything. And if we look into um, the Noveta report on this group, and um, Noveta published one of the best reports about this APT group. They actually said that some of the tools, such as Zox PNG, Gresham, and uh, HiKit, they're actually only used by Axiom. Um, and um, our belief was actually the guy who built these tools for Axiom is also somehow connected to the CCleaner incident. And later, we were even able to connect the CCleaner and the shadow pad incidents together, suggesting that the same group was responsible for both uh, these uh, supply chain attacks. So here's another example when actually this fails. Uh, it's very nice when it works out, but what do we do when it uh, fails? Um, so the Olympic destroyer attack, which I guess some people remember, uh, at the, um, during the Olympic Games in uh, Pyeongchang in uh, South Korea, there was like a significant destructive attack which took down like some of the infrastructure they were using. And um, the first thing uh, that we saw in Tether, the same company, they published a blog and they said they found uh, similarities between Olympic Destroyer and APT-10, which is a Chinese uh, APT group, APT-3, which is another Chinese APT group, and APT-12, another Chinese APT group. So people immediately assumed, all right, so probably it's the Chinese again. Uh, but then, Recorded Future, which is another company uh, working on this kind of code similarity technologies, they posted quite a uh, large analysis of that, and they said that it's actually similar to Lazarus, Lazarus being a North Korean APT. So we have one company saying it's Chinese, we have another company saying it's North Korean. So what is it? So well, actually, if we look at the code, uh, uh, and we have a... Um, Lazarus Blue Norov tool on the left side. On the right side, we have a Olympic Destroyer tool. There's actually uh, uh, some similarity. They're not identical, but there's for sure like a similarity in the code. So nobody can actually contest that they are similar in a way. So what we did uh, uh, when we saw this, we ran our code uh, similarity technology. And we're very disappointed that it didn't find similarities with Chinese groups. It didn't find um, any code similarities with North Korean groups. However, it was quite interesting that it was able to find a small, tiny similarity with a uh, Lazarus APT sample that was used during the Bangladesh uh, bank heist. So how many people are familiar with the Bangladesh bank heist? All right. So. This sample actually had a, uh, and our system pointed out that there is like this fragment, which is exactly the same between the Olympic destroyer and this uh, Bangladesh bank heist uh, attack. And the uh, code sequence, they, well, it's not actually a code sequence, but the byte sequence is exactly that one there. So what is it? That is actually the so-called rich header. So whenever you compile a file using Visual Studio, they embed like a watermark, right, a filigran, 
of the uh, compiler and the tools which are used uh, to build that sample into the header. So when we saw this, like, what's the chance that across the several billion samples that we have, we have only two with this unique uh, combination, and one of them is from the Olympic destroyer attack, the other one was using Bangladesh. So like, the probability is absolutely huge that the same guys are behind the, the attack. However, something didn't kind of you know, pan out. And the trick here was when we started looking in depth at Olympic destroyer, we realized that the rich header didn't actually match the version of the compiler uh, based on the code in the sample. So it almost looked like someone actually copied the rich header from the uh, Bangladesh bank heist attack and put it into these new samples as a very elaborate false flag. So what's interesting is that our technology didn't find any code similarities, but it did spot this uh, header uh, you know, false flag. And we are now actually confident that the Olympic destroyer was not related to Lazarus and was not related to any Chinese APT. It was related to a Russian-speaking hacker group we call Hades. Um, the same group uh, believed to be responsible for the NotPetya, Bad Rabbit, uh, and Ukraine power outages a couple of years ago. So a few other examples. Here's a uh, WannaCry rule. A Yara rule that you build on WannaCry. We built on Yara on WannaCry using our system. It's just five strings. That's like all all that is to the rule. Just five sequence of bytes, but it actually catches Blue Norov, the malware used in the Bangladesh bank heist manuscript, which is another malware used by uh, the Lazarus group to hack into banks, and Decafel, which is a keylogger that was uh, also used by the Lazarus APT group. So it's like a very you know strong uh, link. Now we can actually link WannaCry with all these other tools as well. So this actually makes me believe that probably we are kind of reaching a point where we can uh, start talking about the so-called attribution 2.0. So what does it mean? Well, I think that tasks which took uh, months before or years can now actually be done in minutes. So in, in the past, it used you know, to take us a couple of months to be able to say which APT group is behind which attack. And all this you know, can now be automated. So I believe that this technology actually you know, will become ubiquitous in a couple of years. Everybody will have it for sure. So what that means is that um, at least some part of the attribution of uh, attacks can now be automated. So it can give us, like, you, you need to look into this direction. So there's like some new uh, incident with malware, and uh, this is like especially interesting for companies. When you, let's say, you catch an email, and you know this email drops a malware. Is it targeted? Is it an APT group? Uh, is it for you specifically? Or is it like maybe for 5,000 other companies? Are you the only target of that attack? So this can be, of course, partly automated with uh, the right technology. On the other hand, I think this, as an effect, will have, you know, we'll go, we'll have to see more false flags. So think about this uh, Lazarus malware. It was quite interesting that um, after um, the Bangladesh bank heist, and uh, um, I think it was around uh, April of 2017, the NSA um, made a statement saying that they believe that the Lazarus APT group is behind the uh, Bangladesh bank heist. And almost immediately, the Lazarus guys, they started including Russian keywords in their malware. You know, just because I guess it's fashionable to blame Russia for hacks nowadays. Um, obviously, it didn't fool anyone. Like, just having some poorly written Russian words in the malware doesn't fool people. But this can be, you know, it can lead to more sophisticated kind of false flags like we have seen in the Olympic destroyer where they try to copy the rich header. And there aren't many companies which uh, actually can spot this kind of false flags. Remember, people have said that it's maybe China, it's maybe North Korea, and, and uh, you know, so on. So I think as an effect, uh, uh, also we're gonna see more reliance on open source tools. And this is like kind of a nightmare. When all the hackers, they start using, you know, PowerSploit, Cobalt Strike, Metasploit, 
like uh, good luck determining who is behind that because being just open source tools, it means that you cannot attribute it by code to any specific APT group. Uh, it will be, you know, pretty much it can be used by, by anyone. So that is when things will get complicated and you'll have to use uh, stuff such as, I guess, um, the network infrastructure, command and control servers to find connections between the groups. So I think that, you know, one last thing which I wanted to mention, I think that actually we as a security community, we're doing quite a good job um, uh, looking into cyber espionage campaigns, catching APT groups. We're pretty good actually uh, uh, with cyber sabotage, destructive attacks, because both of them, they rely on malware. However, there's probably another dimension to this problem, like the info war, the information war. And I guess that problem is uh, mass opinion manipulation. We are not very good at spotting, preventing, and teaching people on how to recognize mass opinion manipulation. And here I think that we as a community can do more. We can uh, try to use our skills and knowledge in order to fight these kind of attacks and to make people aware of uh, manipulation, basically, and the fact that they are being used. One of the most common questions is, you know, um, from my friends, they say, I have nothing on my computer, I just use Facebook, so even if I get hit by malware, there's nothing, uh, you know, they can't steal anything from my computer. But information, you know, things, uh, the way you think, the way, you know, you behave, all this information can actually be profiled and then it can be used to manipulate you. So I think that if we fail to do that, it can actually, uh, cost us our democracy, and eventually it can cost us our freedom. So I'll leave you well, with that thought. Thank you very much. I hope this was uh, interesting for you. <laughs>